Democrats understand that given their coalition, the best strategy for them to do is expand the electorate. If they expand the electorate, then they can get more lower class folks to the polls who are more likely to vote Democratic. If they get more African Americans to the poll, they're going to vote Democratic. And so there's a clear strategy here in contemporary American politics because the parties have sorted themselves so clearly, demographically. Okay? And so, um, you know, we, we can talk about Florida real quick, 2000 presidential election. It really sort of put the, the, the microscope on this issue of how different these, these parties are and how important elections are because they're so darn close, right? Um, officially, and people always get mad when, when you say this. No, Bush didn't win. Yeah, he did. He served two terms. Okay? Uh, Bush won by 537 votes in Florida. Right? Can you imagine that? Right? Six million plus votes cast. He won by 537. Right? Um, he won 271 electoral college votes. That's one more than the minimum. Okay? He had one vote to spare by taking Florida. Right? He won the entire South, by the way. Uh, so from there, I want to just go through this slideshow and let you have a sense of what it looks like in terms of this, these restrictive voting laws. Okay? So that's sort of my history of things. I want to just take you through. So here's the issue. Um, there was a nice lead up in the beginning of the Almanac of American Politics, which is published every two years by Michael Barone and sometimes a new co-author. But Michael Barone himself wrote an article in the beginning of the Almanac Almanac of American Politics, and he called it the 49% the nation. Okay? Why the 49% nation? Are you talking about 47% again? Are you talking about one versus the 99? No, I'm not talking about any of that. 49% nation means that there's no real majority in American politics. Okay? There's no real majority. Why do these parties fight like cats and dogs? Because there's no real majority. Okay? In the New Deal era in the 30s, you had a real majority. Okay? You don't these days. So what do they do? They mobilize the hell out of their constituency. Okay? That's the idea. We can't depend on independents. We don't know how they're going to swing from one election to the next. Right? But we know if we can get Democrats to the polls, they're going to vote Democrat. Right? Democratic. Okay? If we get Republicans to the polls, they're going to vote Republican. It's a 49% nation. Okay? Um, and that's why these elections are so bitterly contested by the parties. But let me just show you real quick. This is sort of interesting. This is Florida, okay, this solid line. The dotted line is the nation, okay, that's the national vote. And I don't, you know, we don't have time to do some math here, but I just want you to understand what's going on. If you take all the Democratic votes and subtract the Republican votes from them, and then you divide by all the Democratic and Republican votes cast, that's the percent margin, okay? The closer these lines are to zero, the tighter the, the margin, the smaller the margin, okay? Bush blows out Dukakis in Florida in 1988. Okay? It's not even close. 25 points. Okay? But look what happened since in Florida. It's always near the, the zero. Okay? Elections are really close in Florida. But look at the nation, too. Okay? The nation, too, especially when we get in those later years, 2000 forward, it's very tight. Okay? And it goes back and forth. If it's negative, the Republicans getting more votes. If it's positive, the Democrats getting more votes. But the point is that these parties don't have any permanent majorities. Okay? They don't. Look at the, the House of Representatives. The, the solid line is the total seat difference. So if it's positive, that's the net number of seats for Democrats. Okay? Well, they're doing great in 92, but look at from 94 until Democrats take back over in 2006. They're fighting like cats and dogs, all from 94 for the next 12 years. Any election in the U.S. House of Representatives in any cycle could turn to the other party. Okay? They know that. That's how close these are. But look what happens at the end. You get this crazy volatility. Okay? As these seat margins go up and down. What's going on here? Independence. They don't like the dish they were just served. Okay? So they send it back and they ask a Democrat to make it. Right? And so independents are really messing with these U.S. House majorities. So you got these two really good years for Democrats, 2006 and 2008, and then you get this, as Obama called it, shellacking in 2010, where Republicans pick up a ton of seats. Okay? There's no real majorities in American politics. So the partisan warfare is, is really intense. Here's Obama's coalition to some extent. Think about these, these groups here, blacks, Latinos, women, low-income, young. 
What do they all have in common? Anybody? They're more likely to vote what? <laughs> They're more likely to vote Democratic. Okay. Obama sort of maxed out performance-wise on those groups. That coalition he put together in 2008 was so historic, and especially if you look at the way they supported Obama, right? It's sort of off the charts here. Now, this isn't a surprise when you think about identity politics and the historic nature of this election, but 96% of African Americans voted for Obama in 2008. Latinos, 73%. Okay? Women, 57%. Big gender gap there. Okay? Uh, low income, two thirds. Right? And young voters, 68%. That's 30 years or younger. Right? These are exit poll data. If you, can, if you can get those people to the polls, Right? at high rates, you're going to do really well. Notice the numbers in 2008 are all higher than 2004 and 2000. Right? He just really sort of maxed out in terms of his vote share among these groups. But what's also important about those groups? Restrictive voting laws are going to harm this coalition more than anyone else. Okay? And that's, of course, the coalition that got Obama to the White House. So in 2010, you had this Republican tsunami, as people have called it, right? 63 House seats netted by the Republican Party. Okay, that's their best performance since 38. Okay? Six Senate seats to go with it. About 675 state legislative seats were picked up by Republicans in 2010. It was a tidal wave. Okay? Uh, and we can talk about why that happened. But before 2010, here's the most important thing. Who's deciding these restrictive voting laws? State legislatures. Okay? Before the election, you had 27 Democratic-controlled state legislatures, 14 Republican, 8 split. After 2010, 25 Republican-controlled legislatures, 16 Democratic, 8 split. Okay. So they did very well in picking up control of state legislatures beyond picking up a bunch of seats. Okay. So they had the power in many of these states to put in place these new restrictive voting laws but also they had the desire and motivation because of that, that crowd, Tea Party crowd, is that what they call them? Some of those people? Okay. Uh, they really wanted to push these laws. A lot of these Tea Party types who got into state legislatures, this was at the top of their agenda, is to put in place these restrictive laws. Okay. And so just look at the list here. This is, this is a list that includes laws that passed. Okay. So these aren't just proposed. Tons were proposed, hundreds. Okay. These passed. 11 states with stricter voter ID, okay? Five states that passed, but what happened? They were vetoed, all by Democratic governors, okay? Six states tightened registration in various capacities. Five states reduced the period for early voting. Why would you do that? Okay. Um, three states passed proof of citizenship laws, right? Uh, and two states made restoration of voting rights more difficult. One is Iowa. I bet you can guess the other. Florida. A closer look at voter ID laws. So I really want to focus on voter ID laws now, after showing you that last slide, because that's the one that's been the most prevalent that we've been fighting over, talking about, thinking about. 34 states introduced voter ID legislation after the 2010 election, 2011. 32 states introduced voter ID legislation in 2012. Okay? So, you know, this is very widespread. In 2011, these states passed new photo or, or voter ID laws that are usually strict photo ID, which means you have to have a photo ID when you show up at the polls. It probably has to be government issues. There's all kinds of restrictions on this. Alabama, Kansas, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Wisconsin. I put an asterisk around Rhode Island. Okay? I put an asterisk in front of Rhode Island because it's controlled by Democrats. Okay? This is the one aberration. This is the one anomaly here. What the heck's going on in Rhode Island? Okay? The other states are Republican. Virginia, okay? Virginia passes a uh, voter ID law. And, and Virginia, got Virginia on there. Yeah, Virginia down here. Virginia has a House that's Republican and it has a perfect split in the Senate. It's 2020, okay? Uh, so Virginia is not completely controlled by Republicans, but for all intents and purposes, we're talking about Republican legislation here. So, again, these states all had Democratic governors, and so when they passed their laws in Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Democratic governor vetoed it. In 2012, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Virginia passed new voter ID laws. And Kaya, I think you mentioned, 
If you know about Pennsylvania, it's on hold. Okay, they can't move forward with their, their strict uh, photo ID at the moment. A judge said, uh-uh, there's not enough time to get everyone the ID that they need in time for the election. This is one of, these next two slides are my favorite. <laughs> these are my favorites, right? You, oh, there's bipartisan agreement that uh, these laws are just done to protect the integrity of the electoral system, okay? Oh yeah, poll people, poll the general public, what do they say? We tend to favor ID laws. Why? Because it's a valence issue. That's the way it's phrased. That's the way it's framed, right? Which is to say, we want integrity. We want to make sure everyone who can vote, votes. Okay? When you poll people, a majority say yes. Break it down. Even in the mass electorate in terms of the partisanship, and a majority of Democrats say no. And a majority of Republicans say yes. Okay? These are the state legislatures all right, that, that were involved in passing these laws. Okay? So all these legislatures pass voter ID laws. The red bar up is the percent of Republicans out of the total who voted in favor of voter ID. The blue bar down is the percentage of Democrats who voted no. Okay? Do you see a pattern? Okay? <laughs> Ninety plus percent Republicans, yes, let's do it. Over 80 percent typically of Democrats say no. The, but look at Rhode Island, right? Democratic control. More, more Democrats said yes, right, if you flipped it around. Okay? But that's the, that's the anomaly. Everything else, it, extreme polarization on these measures. Here's, two, here's 2012. Doesn't look much different, does it? Okay. Um, this is partisan warfare, and that's what this is. This isn't really about uh, protecting the integrity of the ballot box. Okay, so let's, let's go to Florida before we wrap up here. Let's, let's go to where we are. May 19, 2011. Governor Scott signed this omnibus, big old bill, all kinds of provisions in it, uh, called House Bill 1355. It went into effect uh, the 1st of July 2011. All right? Look again at the polarization on this bill. Okay? All Republicans in the House voted in favor of it. All, right? all Democrats voted against it. Okay? In the State Senate, not much better. All Republicans, in terms of saying yes, 11 Democrats say no, okay? two abstain, there's only 13 in there by the way, and two Republicans are the only defectors. Okay? Anyone know who they are? Here's a little quiz for you. They, they seem so sound too when you see them in the paper. Paula Dockery and Mike Fasano. Okay? Those are the only two who defected and voted no in the state senate. Okay? So what did this legislation do in Florida? Okay? Because we didn't see Florida in terms of voter ID. They did all kinds of other stuff. Right? Um, look at early voting. They reduced it from 14 days, two weeks to eight. Okay? They eliminated early voting on the Sunday immediately prior to the election. Why did they do that? Because a disproportionate percentage of African Americans vote on Sundays. Okay? And I can show you the evidence if you want to see it. Allows county supervisor of elections to scale back voting hours to a minimum of 48 down from the required 96. Okay? So they did a lot with early voting. Now, this is interesting too, third party registration. Hispanics and African Americans we know are more likely to be registered by third party outfits. Okay? You've heard of some of these groups like uh, Rock the Vote. Okay? Uh, these sort of third party groups that do these registration drives, they made it almost impossible in Florida to do this. They went from a 10 day window to register voters and then hand in those registrations okay? to two days. Right? Two days you've got to go around and get all this stuff and turn it in on time. And guess what, if you don't turn it in on time, it's punitive, right? There's major penalties uh, to, to not complying. So uh, League of Women Voters, other outfits like this, they just say forget it, okay? We're not gonna do it, right? We just can't comply with this law. By the way, this has been overturned, okay? Um, no longer can someone who has moved update their address at the polling place, right? So you show up on election day and you end up at the wrong precinct, you have to vote a provisional ballot. Well, what does that mean? That means your, your ballot may or, might, may or may not be, be counted. Okay? It's provisional. In 48 hours, you've got to go to the county supervisor of elections and prove that you are who you said you were or your provisional ballot is thrown out. Okay? okay, why is this going on in Florida? Well, here's a hunch. Okay? The Florida elector is becoming more racially diverse and the Republican Party can't grow its minority support. It is an overwhelmingly white party, okay? 
Uh, look at Florida. Look how it's changed over time. I don't know if these are in the way or not, but maybe I made that worse. No. Percent white, non-Hispanic, 77% in 1980. 2011, 58%. Okay? African American, 14. 2011, 17%. Hispanics, 9%. 2011, 23%.